Hey, all right. So uh, I'm going to kick off today's recording with a little overview of what I did earlier today. And then, as I often do, I will pass on the torch to me from earlier today. All right, that's the best thing I've done. And uh, yeah, today we're going to be talking about software engineering. Now, this is a different style of software engineering lecture. In the past, I was talking about how you can write software more efficiently, ways to think about complexity. But today is more about the bigger picture, ways in which software has totally transformed the universe and will continue to do so. The reason I'm doing this is I actually remember as a kid uh, sometime in the 1980s thinking it's so strange that the world changed a lot in the last hundred years or whatever. And then it will continue to change dramatically. It's just like interesting to wonder, like, what are these future changes going to be that are going to be such a big deal? Like, you know, my parents and grandparents saw the whole world transform. What transformations will happen to me? So to that point, uh, I found the the big differences between now and when I was a kid really all relies and or like folk, it primarily is oriented around hardware software systems right some kind of computing system uh, and so i'm gonna give some examples of specific ways some of the big milestones that have happened since i was a kid and i will start with this video about uh the internet okay so let me adjust the share so that it works well okay, sound video clip and here we go okay so this is from the today show in 1994 uh where the hosts are discussing this new internet back now 56 pass i wasn't prepared to translate that as I was doing that little tease. Oh, that's that right. little mark with the A and then the ring around it. At? See, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. um, Katie said she thought it was about. Yeah. Oh. But I'd never heard or it. Around. I'd never heard it about. said. I'd always seen around. the mark, but never yeah. heard it said. And then yeah. it sounded stupid when I said it. Violence at NBC. <coughs> yeah, I heard it around big or about. in the lunchroom the other See? week. <laughs> there it is. Violence at NBC. G so he's talking about this symbol. Like, what is that thing? E com. I mean, well, what Allison it? should know. What, what do you is say internet about anyway? Internet is uh, that massive computer right. network, mm -hmm. the one that's becoming really big now. What it's, do you mean that's big? What you, how does one? Not, what do you write to it like mail? No, a lot of people use it and communicate. It, I guess they can communicate with NBC writers and producers. Allison, can you explain what internet is? No, she can't say anything in ten seconds or less. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Allison will be in the studio shortly. What, is, what does it mean? Strange dynamics with these folks, anyway. A giant computer network made up made up of uh, started from. Oh, I thought uh, you were going to tell us what this was. It's so like a, look a computer dictionary. billboard. It's not, it's, it's not in there. It's it, it's it's a computer billboard, but it's nationwide. Right. And it's it's several uh, universities and everything all joined together. And right. And others can access it. And, right. And it's getting bigger and bigger all the time. It just came great. in really handy during the quake. A lot of people, that's how they were communicating out to tell family and loved ones they were okay because all the phone lines were down. I was telling Katie and I was talking. But you don't, need, you don't need that? You don't need a phone line to operate no, internet? No, no. <laughs> so folks are more or less clueless about what the internet is exactly. But of course, the internet has completely reshaped how society functions. Another example was a piece of hardware that made it a lot easier to access this internet. Uh, and that was, of course, smartphones. Uh, this is Steve Jobs introducing the first iPhone when probably many viewers here were quite small. Um, and uh, I think it's remarkable to see how something that was so, that's so commonplace today was so shocking, not that long ago. <clears throat> the demo. That lower right hand corner and push this icon right here. And it's full screen. This. Here and boom, I'm in the iPod. I want to get home. I push the home button right here and I'm home. Back in the iPod, I'm back in the iPod. Now here I am, you can see five buttons across the bottom, playlists, artists, songs, videos, and more. I'm an artist right now. Well, how do I scroll through my list of artists? How do I do this? I just take my finger and I scroll. That's it. Like everyone is just shocked, right? It's amazing to think. Like, this is a huge deal at some point. All right. Uh, another example, now to 2020. I think, uh, you know, this current world of large language models will really be a big deal. Unlike a lot of other flash in the pan technologies, in my opinion, like, say, cryptocurrencies, I think that, that the world of large language models is going to revolutionize uh, technology in some pretty big ways. And I think one of the biggest ways is in programming. So right here, 
uh, in 2020, when GPT-3 was very new, uh, someone built a layout generator. And I'll just show you briefly what this looked like. And this was something that was shocking, but maybe the viewer watching this is used to it by now. And so here you describe a layout and then you get code that represents that layout. Okay, so you write large text that says, welcome to my newsletter and a blue button that says subscribe. Okay, so it generates, it's not perfect. Okay, so you have to do some tweaking. Okay, and so forth. And like, that was shocking in 2020. But now, I'd say it's actually a pretty normal use, a uh, normal tool to use in a programming workflow. I use it all the time, especially when I'm trying to write some fiddly like visualizations. It's just amazing. So as an example, in 2023, building on the large language models, I did a little experiment this semester uh, where I took the fall 2022 final. So that was a multiple choice final because our we had a TA strike. And so uh, unlike normal 61B finals, I could just give the exam to say GPT-4 uh, and say, do the exam and, and we can auto grade it. And so what we found is that GPT-4 ended up doing a little better than the average 61B student on my exam, getting ranked 392 out of 908 uh, and was a little more than a quarter of a standard deviation above the mean. So that's pretty extraordinary, right? It's a big model trained on everything and it did okay on this problem or on this exam. Now I should note, one of the things I'm doing with my TAs right now uh, who are helping out with this project is continuing to explore like what kind of questions did GPT do well at and which ones did it did poorly at. One last example uh, is I uh, decided to see how can GPT-4 do at project three. I came up with a prompt. So this thing called prompt engineering where you come up with like, the way to phrase the problem you want. So in about five minutes of prompt engineering, I was able to get GPT-4 to do most of Project three, phase one. Uh, if you know that project well, then you'll see that's pretty cool, right? Here's all the random rooms. Here's the hallways connecting them. And with the exception that the hallways are not, uh, don't have walls, it's actually pretty good. Okay. So that's pretty amazing to me that uh, I'm sure somewhere in the corpus of code that it was trained on, it knows something about this project. Uh, but I'm guessing the way I phrased the prompt, it really did build it from scratch, so to speak, whatever that means for a stochastic parrot like GPT-4. So the broader point is that over time, we've seen these really major advances. And what this class will do for you is give you the skills to be part of that world transforming process of building this kind of software. And that's true whether you're a data scientist or a computer scientist or a hardware engineer who's picking up what the software is like, or even just anybody else who's learning the software skills. I really, really, truly believe that this class is incredibly empowering and will allow you to continue to reshape the world. So with that in mind, I'm now gonna kick things over to me from earlier today and uh, all, all the audience who participated. Uh, and so I will see you around next time. Alrighty. So let me full screen this more properly. I'm gonna give you a case study of two different things you can do. Uh, in life uh, and two different types of applications, your social media and Khan Academy. So I'll start with, um, this isn't really social media, but it, it's the same idea that I may get to with social media. So anybody here ever played Candy Crush or one of its variants, right? It's like on, okay, so some of you. Um, and so basically the game, you know, it's a little puzzle games. Um, and the mobile version has this uh, feature where it tracks the number of days you've played in a row. So each day you play, you get to like, hi, I'm on day 151. I'm not um, breaking my streak. And then you also get like a bonus item. You get two hours of this thing that makes the game more fun in some way. But if you miss a day, the counter resets. So maybe obvious question, why does this feature exist in Candy Crush? Keep you playing the game. Yeah, right. Okay, exactly right. More engagement. Okay, cool. And there's probably some ads and they're selling your attention. Okay, Snapchat. Um, anybody here? It's kind of old school. Mm -hmm. I have a more up to date in a minute, but I'll I'll talk about Snapchat for a moment. Anybody here has had a snap streak in your time on the earth? Okay, cool. So for those of you who have not had a snap streak, the idea is if you message your friend, say Brody G, and Brody G also messages you on the same day, you have communicated according to the Snapchat algorithm, and so you're yeah, incremented by one day. And here I have now been talking to Brody G for 110 days straight. And this is how you know who your real friends are. Okay. So why does this feature exist in Snapchat? What do you think? 
So you know who your real friends are. No, probably not. What is the real reason? Keeps you using the thing, the Snapchat. There you go. All right, what is internet? Okay, right, there you go. Okay, TikTok, another version. So the moment you open TikTok, a video starts playing. This is the one it gave me on my phone this morning, okay? And it only takes milliseconds to get to the next video. And it's again, I'm not gonna ask the question this time. The reason TikTok starts playing the moment you open the app is to keep you watching. And the reason it's so easy to go to the next video is because they did some A-B tests and people loved it. And they could watch TikTok videos for an hour. Um, I don't know what this video is exactly. Uh, it's, it purports to be, I don't know, is someone here from China? When you were a child, were you trained to assemble firearms in a room full of other children? No. Okay. Well, this guy believes here that in fact that's your deal. Uh, and I'll note that I don't really use TikTok because I think I'm slightly too old to care about it. But actually, I looked at the comments on this video and it implied that there are people older than me on TikTok, for example, better than a drag show. And in fact, most of the comments are like, Kids these days don't even know how to do whatever kind of thing we do back in the day. Here's another one. And our kids barely know how to get a job after school, but the Chinese are armed to the teeth. <laughs> Their children are killers. They'll take the world from us. That's the feeling. Anyway, now, why did this person post this video? Anybody want to speculate? Yeah? What's that again? Oh, yeah, those people to comment, but what do they get out of it? I guess they get some likes, yeah? What's really in it for them? I mean, maybe they're just inflating their own ego, yeah? Uh, well, I'll tell you why. If you look at one of the quotes by True Colors, the poster of this video, he says, fuck school and hard labor, learn about affiliate marketing. You can learn how to make 6000 a month from a two-minute video. So he is posting stories about Chinese children with guns in order to get you to realize that you too can make money by posting videos about Chinese children with guns and selling to other people the process of posting videos online in order to sell affiliate marketing videos to get people to sell affiliate marketing videos, et cetera. That's, that's what's going on here, I think. Anyway, that's maybe not the most concise way of putting it. Yeah. Anyway, so TikTok, you know, it has its own cottage industry of um, this sort of thing going on. All right. So that's kind of fun. Okay. What are some other engagement generating features that you've interacted with in your time? I don't know. What do you think? Anybody play any kind of video games? Anything else in the whole world that you're like, ah, this is clearly really fun. I think someone did it to make me like to use this thing a lot. I don't know. It's hard to say where you draw that line, but draw the line however you want. Yeah, go ahead. Right, daily rewards on what? In-game money. Pick a game so I can call you out as a nerd. Genshin Impact. No, what? <laughs> okay, all right, I pick Genshin. I don't know if Genshin Impact has daily rewards. I've never played it. Uh, yeah, yeah. What? All right, what else? I hit a nerve there. I don't know why. All right, what else? Yeah. Your code on IntelliJ. Oh, that's fun. Ah, so is that, okay. For you, it isn't. I mean, hmm. It makes fun using IntelliJ. Right. Okay. Yeah. It makes you want to use IntelliJ. And also, in some ways, it helps hook your 61B students. Yes. Okay. Cool. What else? Yeah. Oh, Ed Sims announcement. <laughs> but you have to go to the site to see it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the Ed, the sneaky. All right, what else? Uh, yeah, go ahead. The second row and I'll come to you next. All right, what kind of examples do we have? I mean, sometimes it's just computation time, but. All right. Yeah, I got farming simulators. You got to wait for what's the thing? Crops to grow. All right. Okay, some, oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, that's a good point. All of them. This would be like your Diablo type games or whatever. All right. 
Yeah. Uh, someone I don't usually hear from. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Netflix, would they like to bring on the next episode? Just blasting you with that next episode. My absolute least favorite thing. Uh, yeah, I have that turned off aggressively on all things. Mostly because I have kids. Otherwise, they're going to get sucked into the vortex of eternal watching. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Duolingo. Come learn. Nah. Yeah, all right, yeah. Which kind of marketplace? Ah, okay. Create own maps. It's like a kind of a community engagement feature. Yeah. Let me see if there's anything in chat anybody wants to highlight here. Duolingo, B courses, FIFA 23. Okay, got it. All right, I'll take two more. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Leaderboard and where? Okay. And oh, Clash of Titans, this one? Plans. I don't know anything about games anymore. I'm too old. I'm too busy. I'm union bargaining instead of playing video games. Uh, let's see. I'm going to try and see someone I don't think I've heard from in class ever. Go ahead. When you bet and win money, right? Yeah. Lose, you want it back. Um, this also applies to Wall Street bets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Best. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, cool. Good. So those are the things that engage, engage you. And some of them are kind of systematic things. Some of them are specific, uh, some specific mechanism, like the snap streak or whatever. Okay. What are some good things about these? Not snap streak, but we'll just call them like uh, engagement generating features. So sell me on why these are a good thing. Because if you work at a company, are you going to stand and say these are bad? We have to destroy all of them? What's actually good about them? All right, go ahead. Makes company money. So the job, the company can do its good. I mean, you could argue that like advertising is an evil, but it's a necessary evil because it's how you actually make money and can make the product. Yeah, go ahead. Build communities, right? It keeps, it like snap streaks really do increase engagement between people. Um, increase engagement between people. Um, between people, well, not sure. I mean, who knows? Uh, yeah, this side of the room, because I haven't heard from you guys. From out over there. Go ahead. You learn a lot on Duolingo and Ed. Oh, yeah, you get to find out, like, come to lecture today. It's more fun that way. Although maybe that was in the email. Okay, one more. Yeah, go ahead. All right, streaks. It's very specific. Right, cool. <laughs> Good. What are some negative examples? I'm gonna do the first one for you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That was a good, a good uh, off the board, back in the basket type situation. All right, what's next? Yeah. Yeah, uh, what addiction though? Yeah, I mean, addictive behavior in general. Yeah, all the negative things that come with playing Genshin Impact all day or whatever. Why is that such a big deal? Behave uh, uh, behavior, not so good. All right, yeah. Okay, good. Distraction from what? What you are supposed to be doing. Well, we're getting philosophical now. What are you supposed to be doing? I was gonna like, yeah, work. <laughs> Aha. Yeah, like working, right, okay. Homework, whatever else. But this is actually a pretty deep question. Like, how should you spend all your time? We'll talk a little more about that in a little while. Uh, yeah. Say again? Wasting electricity, right. That's a, well, it depends on what you think you're doing. Uh, it, it's a small amount, but an amount. Maybe you have a, a hobby that's very electricity hungry, though, like Bitcoin mining. Good. Yeah. Oh, right, yeah, so um, algorithms that show you only information with which you already agree, and it gets, you, it gets you stuck in a weird loop. Yeah, all right, someone else seemed like they had an itchy hand. Yeah. And it depends on how you feel about data. The more you use, 
The more of your data goes in. And there's a lot of discussion and ethics about whether or not the data that powers this was collected ethically. Right. All right. Great. Okay. Uh, all right. TikTok. I'm just going to pick one because I know it uses a lot of time uh, in people's lives. So what do you think? Like, if you had to pick TikTok in particular, I'll talk about how much money TikTok takes in a minute. But what do you think? TikTok, net positive or negative? I don't know. Someone give me a yes or a no and why you think so. I'll take a few of these. Getting some no's. Vocal no's. Interesting. Okay, all my anti-TikTok folks. How many of the folks who just thumbs down use TikTok? No, some. Okay, right. <laughs> all right, someone give me a vocal reason. What's a what's a net negative feature of TikTok overall? Yeah. Ah, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, shortens attention span. It is very interesting. Um, attention span, geez. Uh, I just read an article called The End of English Majors. It was really like interesting and a little sad. And it was talking about trying to get people to read like a 500 page book today is like trying to land a 747 on like a rural airstrip because everybody just like cannot focus for that long. I think it's a big deal. Yeah. Other thoughts that are negative. You can go positive or negative. I'll take whatever. Go ahead. Right. Interesting. I bet that's not true, but I maybe I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, you get shot straight into an echo echo chamber where you believe mummies are running the government or whatever it is. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, TikTok is short-term gratification. So it's like just like uh, like eating a giant pile of sugar. It's like not really good for you, ultimately. Yeah, I mean, I'm, that's my opinion. I'm not a dietitian. Go ahead. Uh, that's is that a positive? Yeah, yeah. So positive, you can take on, or you can you use the world, all kinds of news. Yeah, I'll take a couple more. Yeah. Uh, to reach an audience, that's a positive, right? You get more voices out there uh, or negative, depending on uh, if the content's positive or negative for the universe, good. Negative, huge amounts of disinformation. Yeah, I mean, that's a big one. That's the one that makes me often the most uh, anxious. Someone I haven't heard from yet. Go ahead. Right, regardless of content, nuance is lost in very short videos that only reach people if they receive high engagement. Um, if you open TikTok, there's a high chance that something will be on fire, like literally on the screen, because it's like, you know, it gets your attention immediately. Uh, right, so nuance is tough. Okay, cool. So uh, let's talk about Khan Academy. It's kind of like the opposite of a technology product that someone might work on. Um, I'm assuming everybody here has seen Khan Academy, but on the off chance you haven't, maybe you're an international student and it didn't reach you. Yeah, it's probably changed. Um, so I'm a learner. I want to know about uh, at the end or some kind of thing. Uh, okay. It's not the right edit. Oh, but I don't I have to make an account. I don't think I used to have to do that. Whatever. Okay, I'll continue Google. Okay. Yeah, there's another Josh hug. It's this guy. See this guy. This is the other Josh hug. So yeah, so this guy, he's also in technology, but I have Josh Hug on GitHub and I own joshhug.com. But this guy's got Josh Hug on Twitter. He would not friend me on Facebook 10 years ago. But anyway. Yeah. By the way, there's another Josh Hug. Who here has emailed the other Josh Hug and gotten the auto reply? Nobody? Okay, there was a grad student here who was a master's student, I think in statistics two years ago, and he's j.hug, whereas I'm hug at Berkeley. Anyway, okay, so where were we? Uh, I'm logged in. Okay, algebra foundations. Great, I was learning how to do algebra, probably in this lecture. Like, base, not abstract algebra, just like the basic stuff. Okay, so I want to learn about uh, how to do simplify expressions with like terms. Okay, I don't know why it's a polar bear, but it's like, you know, algebra. 
And there's like little exercises you could do. And it's a really nice website. And probably a huge fraction of you have used it at some point. All right, that's Khan Academy. So let's go positive and negatives. It's a great educational website. We do all kinds of cool stuff. What are some good things? I mean, obviously we get uh, access to education or easy access to education. Um, all right, okay, what else? What's other things? Maybe more nuanced than that. And I'm gonna go shorter on this one. Yeah. Asynchronous, Asynchronous education, yeah. Okay, so uh, you can learn when you want, however you want. Well, within the Khan Academy bounds. Okay. Uh, anybody have any other like interesting or like kind of out of the box positives you want to throw out there? Yeah. Great for lower income, for lower income communities with that access. Um, to great local teachers or whatever it may be. Yeah. Any others? Yeah. Trustworthy resource, right? It's like it has a reputation. When it teaches you something, you know that it's probably reasonably good. Probably there's some small errors. Okay, one more. Yeah. Uh, has a reward system that. Oh, it keeps you coming back. Yeah. So it actually uses those like engagement tools for, for good coming back. Okay, um, any negatives anybody can think of? Anybody experienced a negative or whatever? Yeah, go ahead. Say again? Oh, right, yeah. Teachers use Khan Academy videos instead of teaching themselves. And that may be a problem because maybe it's harder to reach the student on like an inspirational level, right? It's uh, You're outsourcing a part of the job that maybe you shouldn't. You had the bad judgment in some circumstances where you should have been being the person leading the students, yeah. Right, not as high quality as an interactive form of instruction. Okay, I'll take a couple more. Uh, yeah. Yeah, unclear how it accommodates disabilities. Uh, yeah. Limit to how many languages. Yeah, right. Uh, well, it's, it's it's a downside of Khan Academy, but I wouldn't say it's a negative impact exactly. Yeah. Um, Right, and this one could be like it's uneven access. So I'll call both of these uneven access. Um, exacerbates inequalities. And it's kind of controversial of that statement, I'm sure, but it's one way to spin it as a negative. Okay, I'm, just, yeah. I'm taking all comers. One more, if anybody has one. Yeah. Right, um, as a not so highs. Okay, all right, okay. If you don't know, you'll, you'll know. Okay, good, okay. So question for you, um, you're gonna have to get a job at some point and you'll have a lot of options on your plate, you know, Meta, Amazon, some random startup, ByteDance, Khan Academy, you know, like the city of Berkeley, um, plenty of people that wanna hire you with your skills. So why would you maybe prefer working at TikTok over Khan Academy? Okay, yeah, go ahead. Money is a huge one, All right, okay. Probably the biggest one, other reasons. Well, yeah, I mean, that's fair because it's such a big deal, yeah. Go ahead. Benefits, okay? Like what? <laughs> Money, okay. That was a good joke. Okay, go ahead. Power, okay. Tell me more though. I think there's something important here. Why do you have power working at TikTok versus... Everyone uses it, right? Right? Yeah, well, everyone uses it. Your work has... Fair, right. But your work reaches a lot of people. I'll have a caveat though. One of my former TAs went to go work. I'll take the comment next. Uh, went to go work at um, YouTube a number of years ago. She's just like super brilliant, awesome TA. Uh, and she was working at YouTube. And even though YouTube is huge and reaches a bunch of people, she was working on like a corner of the product that she ultimately found pretty boring. It was about like uh, something in YouTube Creator Studio, something to engage creators and keep them coming back to YouTube. And she was spending so many hours of her life doing this. It's just like, why am I doing this? Like, obviously, YouTube, you have reach, but uh, ByteDance is 150,000 employees. So one note is that you're just one little person out of 150,000. So it's kind of true, but kind of not true. Anyway, just in case you're thinking, like, I want influence or I want to make a, a, an impact, being at a big company does not necessarily have you do that. In fact, um, another one of my former TAs, I poached him for my, my side company because he was at a large tech company. Uh, and was bored because he wasn't doing anything important. Yeah, all right. 
TikTok is growing very quickly, right? It, oh, yeah, fair, okay. Right, hires lots more people with lots, um, lots of different skills. So it's just like more opportunities. Yep, yeah, I'll take maybe like three more. Um, I'm gonna go for like people I haven't heard yet. I don't think I've heard from you yet. Sorry, you had a strategic cough. Try again, someone coughed over you. Right. Right, TikTok is international. Um, opportunities all over. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Lack of, dignity. lack of dignity. Tell me more of that. Oh, you have a lack of dignity. Therefore, you have no qualms working for the machine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I didn't say it. I... One more. I'm looking for those hands I haven't heard yet, though. Go ahead. Funny. <laughs> all right. Fair. Okay. Great point. So I do want to mention, I have this little table I put together. So ByteDance, which is the company that's TikTok, last year they brought in $85 billion in revenue, earning a $25 billion profit. And they had 150,000 people working for them. So on average, if you divide the revenue by the employees, each average person, the average person they hired to do anything brought in $566,000 of revenue. It's a shocking amount of money, right? So when they're hiring, they're thinking, I'm paying you in dollars, and then we're going to generate $566,000 on average. I mean, obviously, it's spread out across all kinds of jobs. <clears throat> By contrast, Khan Academy, it's revenues. They're not really revenues exactly because it's a nonprofit, but um, they brought in $0.013 billion in revenue, or $13 million, and they also received $66 million in gifts. And they're only 201 people, uh, well, 201 uh, sentient creatures. 180 of humans, 16 dogs, five cats, according to the website. Uh, and if you divide just by the humans uh, who are part of the team, it's $72,000 in revenue. And I don't know what that revenue is from, but yeah. Okay. So it's a much smaller scale enterprise, obviously. But I think it reflects the state of the world, right? That like resources go towards things that generate huge amounts of profit, as opposed to things like Khan Academy. And I mean, this is like the fact that money was answers one, two, three, and like 11 are really important. And it's just kind of had the way the world works. When you try to decide how should I allocate my time, often you allocate it in part because of how well you're paid, right? Like recently, I've taken on side gigs consulting. So eight hours a week, I spend working for a company. I find the work very fun and interesting and like technically cool, but crucially, they also just pay me more money than Berkeley does. So I spend eight hours a week. That's the maximum I'm allowed. And by the way, that's how they retain faculty is giving us eight hours a week to do other things. Thank you. But it also means there are eight hours in which I was not replying to your posts or handling, for example, uh, people asking about their project to be scores. So anyway, what's that? Well, I didn't used to do that. Yeah, I, this is new to me, Justin. But you will, I'll show you how to do this. It's important. <laughs> hey guys, well, the thing is, these guys are going to make way more money than both of us in two years. And that's only where they start. And then from there, it's it's just like an exponential thing. And we're going to get like a token amount every year for a while. Yeah. Right. Well, I that's an open question. Is GPT going to replace all of you or just amplify your power yet more? I don't know. Because remember, like in the spread of programmers, you guys are like in this top like 5% or whatever where you're at. So you might be safe. Maybe not. So maybe I'll be laughing, hanging out on the beach drinking slime out of eggs or whatever people do these days. I don't know. If, yeah. Say again? Top 5%? Just think about where you are in the world. Like, there's not that many Berkeley students. You just, there are a lot of Berkeley students. But think about how many people were born in like, you know, was a person born every like second or so? Is that about right? For a second now? I just estimate it. It's like an order of magnitude thing. So, okay, this room didn't take that long to get born. Like, there's a lot of people that were born this year. That's kind of a Donald Trump line. A lot of people. Many people are saying the number of people born this year. Truly incredible. Anyway, so you just think about how absurdly lucky the circumstances of your birth are. Uh, it's pretty wild. So that's, that's just all the people. But then even among programmers, most of them didn't go to, like, Berkeley, MIT, or whatever else, right? So, you know, I think you're in a pretty good spot. Yeah. All right, anyway, so 
we talked a little bit about our own personal feelings about what things are good or bad about all these different apps. We had some fun times. And uh, I want to give you a sense of uh, technology workers and what they've had to say about like the fruits of our labor. I think technology is really great. I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't. But there's obviously like, it's like throwing just like gasoline and matches all over the place. I'm like some weird stuff's happening and all over the place with technology. Like a lot of bad stuff has happened. Lately. So Tristan Harris and some other folks have put together this thing called the Ledger of Harms. And the basic idea is to collect wisdom and important studies that give you a sense of like what really can go wrong. And I think it's an interesting read that you as, you know, young burgeoning people that are going to go out there and run the world in, you know, two to 10 years. It's just good to be a little thoughtful. So I think this is a fun read. It's maybe a little too polished uh, for your taste, but I'll give you a sense. Okay. So to motivate this, I'll give you some classic concerns expressed by tech leaders. One of the early executives at Facebook, you see this sort of thing a lot. Like people get really excited about technology, they help build it, and then they think, God, what have I done? All right, here's one of them. Shamath said, I think we've created tools that are ripping apart the social fabric of how society works. Quite possibly true. Uh, Sean Parker, the Napster guy. Anybody here, like, I feel like it's a generation gap. Napster, are you familiar with Napster? Okay. You probably heard about it from the movie. Yeah. Right, okay, yeah. When I was in college, though, there was like the thing where you could suddenly download any music. So I was like, before there was Spotify, it was, yeah, one of the first really big piracy things. It was really great for hearing any music you wanted. And then Spotify eventually did it much better because you didn't have to be ripping off artists so much. <laughs> anyway, so uh, as Sean Parker put it, God only knows what Facebook is doing to our children's brains. Uh, one uh, pretty prominent technology journalist, uh, journalist, Farhad Manju, said the technologies we were excited about 10 years ago, now this is 15 years ago, are now implicated in every catastrophe of the day. Uh, and this is kind of on the 2016-2017 era when this stated. Uh, I like this one a lot. You were saying technology distracts you from what you're supposed to do. Interesting question. What should I be doing? So as Justin Rosenstein put it, he, he created the like button, which was the thing on Facebook and also Asana, the productivity tool. And he says, these are our lives. These are our precious, finite, mortal little lives. The idea that we're spending them distracted, not accomplishing the things that we're trying to do is just painful. It's crazy, right? He's pretty profound. Yeah. And then as Roger uh, McNamee says, he's a very interesting guy. Uh, one of these days, I'm gonna get him to talk to 195. He gives like 300 talks a year about how technology is bad. Um, he said, Facebook appeals to your lizard brain, primarily fear and anger. And this is like five years ago again. And with smartphones, they've got you every waking moment. There's also this old thing. Uh, I like this tweet, which is that uh, tech enthusiasts are like, my entire house is smart. And then tech workers are the only piece of technology in my house is a printer and I keep a gun next to it. So I could shoot it if it makes a noise I don't recognize. Which I, I can appreciate, right? For a long time, I kept my phone very far away from me when I went to sleep. I have failed lately, uh, but I, it helps. All right. So my thoughts is like, really, it is the case. I really do think that technology companies, many of which you work for, including, I mean, Berkeley as an entity, inflicts like really big negative externalities, which is basically collateral damage upon the world. Uh, and most of them, I'd say, are still good, right? They do negative damage, but they're good in the same way that like, I drive a car, which inflicts carbon on the world, but it's also useful for getting somewhere. Okay? So I use Facebook like very rarely, but I use it to post pictures of my kids for my family back home. Basically. So, you know, it's an... now my personal sense is that these negative externalities are not often just greedy people who don't care. It's mostly unintended consequences by well intentioned people who are not really thinking it through. Now, that's not always true. There are certainly, like in the private equity space, there's companies that basically exist to like squeeze every last bit of value out of something without regard for consequence. But I don't think that's the case for the most part. So, I mean, yeah, plenty of bad folks, but I just don't think that's the, that's my personal opinion. I don't think that's the motive force where the negative things happen. Okay. So I think that generally workers, especially, but often executives care about these issues. But, you know, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that when it comes down to money, like I, you might not have had this experience, but you will in the next 10 or 20 years where like someone is clearly has an opinion because it financially benefits them. And like the example I have is like whenever my grandmother died and there was this huge fight over a small amount of money. It's like just insane, made no sense. There's this old Upton Sinclair quote basically that imagining a big technology company trying to decide how to allocate resources uh, or, or who to hire, how to operate in a market. Uh, this, this quote is, it's difficult to get a man to understand something. It's an old quote. Uh, when his salary depends on his not understanding it, right? So a classic example that I always think about here is Facebook. 
um, in Burma, aka Myanmar, whenever they first showed up, they were like the internet. Like as as people in Myanmar got smartphones, Facebook was the the app that they used to do everything, and it became sort of a, a bedrock piece of society. Um, and the autocracy that runs Myanmar did uh, like took advantage of this as a sort of a, a stealthy propaganda tool, where they would pose as like beauty queens and then use that to. Uh, kind of toe the party line and ultimately we're like carrying out effectively a, a program of racial cleansing, which was pretty like insane. And the problem was that Facebook was just not paying attention because there was no incentives. There was nobody paying attention. There was, there was looking to see, hey, nobody here speaks Burmese. It was quite a, a catastrophe. Okay. So there's this Center for Humane Technology that basically it's Tristan Harris and a bunch of other folks that have compiled examples of things that are negative uh, that you can read about. And um, this is all in the form of the ledger of harms. And it's basically to show you what those specific externalities are and they have a whole bunch of categories. And the idea is that for those of you who are going to be rank and file engineers, it's just a way for you to reflect. Okay. So I'm going to make you look at it in a second. So the ledger has a bunch of things in it. I'm not going to say them all, but it's like, what are ways in which we have weaker attention span? And what are the actual citations from studies? Uh, in what ways, like, we have this sense that people are more depressed now because of the way they engage with social media. What is the actual evidence? That sort of thing, okay? Uh, and so for each category, they give some research and citations. So I'm gonna do something a little funny, uh, which is I would actually like everyone to take a look at it just, just so you have it in mind. So I'm gonna have slides. So if you have a device of some kind, take a peek. You can either go to this website or you can look at the slides from today. I just want you to take a minute to look at this thing and find one that resonates with you and just like chat with a neighbor for a minute. Okay, so that's my plan. So you can either look at the slides, here they are, you can look at these versions, or you can look at their site. So I give you guys like two minutes just to look at it and see if it's a thing that's useful to you in life. If you're on Zoom, you can post some on Zoom chat and I'll look at it. Okay, two minutes, look at this thing. Just like find something you're like, oh, that's interesting. Is it working? Maybe I'll make a yell key. Okay, you can yell key radio if you want instead. <laughs> okay, so find something that's interesting to you. I'm gonna walk over here and talk to you. All right. Okay, my only goal there was just to get you looking at this in case it's interesting to you. Could be good dinner conversation or whatever else. All right. Since they built it, you ought to know it exists. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna round out the what all I gotta say in a moment. Actually, any anybody spot anything that just is like especially compelling? Yeah, go ahead.
Right. Right. Yeah. And I am honestly like, yeah, the idea that you guys were just like dropped into the internet as I know it now, whenever you're teenagers is insane to me. Like, I don't know what it did to your brains. seems like you turned out okay, but man, uh, it's, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure there's a lot that, that you've read or seen that you wish you had not. All right. Anyway. Okay. So let's go back round out by talking about spending our effort wisely. And I want to just reiterate what it is that you have, like what this class, what this discipline, even if you're not a CS major or a data science major, just knowing what you know in this class, where it gets you. Okay. So software, I really just have to reiterate, it's something really different than the other things that you can learn how to build. Okay. So I've said this before, perhaps in this class, I don't remember, but it's a line of mine, which is like, unlike other disciplines, it's really, it's just not physics based exactly. There's physics, yes. And you'll learn about it 61C or or we take the EE 105, 140 type classes, sure. But really the, the beyond those basic physical constraints of how fast computation can run and how much memory it can use, the, the difference between being able to build TikTok, like we had the technology to build TikTok uh, from a hardware level, like, you know, eight, nine, 10 years ago. It's just getting to the point where you have all the data and the systems and the, all everything kind of running all together. And, and the only thing that stands between you and building something that's as big as GPT or TikTok is ultimately the act of creativity, coming up with the idea that will get you there. I mean, yes, again, Chat GPT took a lot of hardware, but without the idea of the transformer, which was this interesting idea in machine learning, it wouldn't be doing what it's doing. Okay? So whenever you want to build some kind of software system, it's really about understanding what the heck you're doing. And as you've seen in this class, I'm sure when writing programs, when they get beyond a certain level of complexity, your brain cannot hold on to it. And what this class tries to do is give you ways to have sort of safety equipment to be able to navigate these complicated ideas. So like writing unit tests or breaking things into sub pieces, you know, deep modules or whatever we said in one of the software engineering lectures. Good stuff, okay? Now, once you have this skill, you are now someone who can go into ByteDance and generate those $566,000 of revenue on average because your effort is that important. So if I look at other companies, I don't have ByteDance on the list. Here is Meta, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple. If you take the revenue per employee, when Meta hires somebody, at least year, last year, they were looking at $1.6 million in revenue. Okay? That's huge. So imagine that you're trying to hire somebody to like move a couch, right? There's a lot of people you could hire to move couches, but some of them are very strong and carry very large couches. You guys with the skill set in this class, it's like it's like a you know a sectional, it's like a U-shaped sectional. It's like it's very big. You can carry large couches. That's what I'm going for here. Like your skills produce something that is of absurd amounts of value. Okay, these are the revenues, and on the right are the profits per employee. Uh, Amazon, you'll notice, is a less profitable company overall because they have a large amount of capital expenditures. If you look at companies like Exxon, same deal. They make tons of money, but per employee, it's not as impressive. Okay. And so the skills that you have, everybody's going to want you, right? The university wants you to come work and help build uh, the new uh, Cal Central or whatever, right? Uh, the, the B courses folks, people want you. The, you know, the government agencies want you. Khan Academy wants you. ByteDance wants you. Everybody wants you. And you get to choose how you spend your career. And so I'm not going to say that like working at a big technology company is bad. I think it's great. You have a great impact. Those companies produce clearly very valuable things because all of us use products by all of these companies. Maybe not every single one of them, but I don't know. It, it's, I would bet most people in this room interact with products from all five of these companies fairly often. Okay? The other thing is, like, even if you're somebody who wants to do, I don't know, startups or like work in the public good, going and working at a big company like Google is still a tremendously interesting experience. You get to see how the machine really works on the inside. Like, What are the software practices that happen in there? I think that's a really valuable and interesting thing. Even if your personal goal, if you are a, a red-shirted revolutionary, is to destroy the system, you must first understand it. Okay, so I have no, I have no compunction about where you go to work. That's kind of interesting here. Uh, if you look at uh, you know, spring, I have a couple of surveys from 195, I think it was. Or maybe it was actually 61 B. It was 61 B. It says right here. Um, I asked, like, what companies would you work for? There's obviously some reputational differences at this is uh, no, I would not work at Amazon. No, I would not work at Facebook. No, I would not work at Google, so forth. And the yellow is the yeses if you were offered a job. Why these specific four companies and not others? I don't know. I picked arbitrarily and it was on the survey twice. 
So it's kind of interesting to get a sense of what, what your peers think. Just some data to reflect on. I don't know what to say about it. Okay. I don't need a words. There was just supposed to be nothing on this. Slide. Okay, so wrapping up, I just really want to reiterate that, that you guys are really building something truly tremendous in terms of its impact on the world, like, or the skill set. And that uh, I'd like you to be self-reflective about it, you know, in the short term, be prosperous and all that, but realize like the, the lever that you are able to, that this class is giving you to move the entire world really is a truly incredibly large thing. Okay, that's all I got for you today. I will see you guys on Friday. I'll see, oh, thank you. So Friday is, uh, of course, phase one being done. And I'll also talk to you about the theoretical fastest sort possible. See you then.